I think I was always an outsider, someone that's trying to play music that the banjo isn't typically in, whether I'm playing with a string quartet, playing with Chick Corea, playing with the flectones, you know, playing, a, you know, orchestras. Banjo isn't in that music. I played banjo in high school, so it wasn't like I was one of the cool kids because I played the banjo. If anything, it was the opposite. And yet I still loved it. It didn't stop me one bit. Um, but something about the sound, um, uh, I, I think of it as a high-tech primitive sound in, in that it has a very old sound. It's as old as can be, and yet the way it's played almost sounds like a computer is doing it. It's just so technically uh, advanced, so virtuosic. But it's almost like a dormant gene that is activated by, by a certain thing. And, um, and I'm a banjo person, and I was a banjo person before I heard the banjo. I just didn't know it yet. But from the moment I heard it, I, I never forgot it. But I was into a kind of a modern New York kind of banjo playing that was very influenced by my teacher. I was lucky enough to study with a guy named Tony Trishka uh, in my third year of playing banjo. And he was pushing it. He was, he was going way out uh, off of the deep end. So um, fast forward and I end up uh, moving down south and I discover that um, you know people who play traditional bluegrass don't necessarily like Yankee banjo players. <laughs> you know? So now I'm an outsider in this new, in this new place. We were at this square dance in Nashville, Tennessee. I was actually with my boyfriend at the time, and he was in the band on the stage. And I love, I love square dancing and contra dancing. And I looked at her and says, wow, she's something else. We met that night, and it was really lovely to meet him. I mean, his name preceded him. Now I'll admit, his music wasn't exactly my taste. You know, I really like the old, the old croon, you know, the old crooners from the mountains and the high lonesome stuff, the really raw stuff. So I'll even admit, once I was at the Gray Fox Bluegrass Festival and the Flectones were playing, and I, I, I went and watched something else. She liked the trad <laughs> stuff. She liked the stuff that was more uh, obviously rooted to the tradition, and I was pushing the edges, and it wasn't necessarily her thing. Right, um, but. Which is okay. You are you, like an excellent bottle of wine, you know, it opened up. It's not It opened that bad. up to me. No, it became beautiful. And yeah. <laughs> but you know, if you leave the, the, the bottle open for too long, it can go bad too. It can. Yeah. That's why we got to cork it every once in a while. I grew up on the Upper West Side, New York City, on West End Avenue in a, a three and a half room apartment with my mother and my older brother. My mother had split up with my father when I was one or two years old, somewhere in there. So my mother and my father had this deal that if we were boys, my father would name us. If we were girls, my mother would name us. And my father won in both cases, me and my older brother. And so he named us after classical composers. So he named me after uh, Janacek, um, Webern, and Bartok, all Hungarians. And then he named my brother Ludwig. So um, I think I got a better end of the deal. Chick Corea was a big hero of mine. I went to see him when I was, I guess, 17 years old at the Beacon Theater. But the sheer level that he played at was just phenomenal. So many, you know, fast forward many, many years later, and he actually invites me to do a, a duo project with him. And I couldn't believe how fortunate I was. And I still can't believe how fortunate I was because um, I, he was the, one of the guys I wanted to learn from. If I could play anything like him, I would be so thrilled. But at one day, it dawned on me that my job was not to play as good as Chick Corea, it was to stimulate him to play things he'd never played before. Because I would do some banjo stuff, and he would look at me like with that eye over the piano, and he would just start going into stuff like by what he heard me do with my three finger roll, groups of three. So he'd start doing groups of three, and then he'd start group rolls with groups of five and seven and all the finger things he could do, and he just, he just like look at me like that, and, uh, and the ideas would just start happening. And, um, yeah, I miss him a lot. He was, uh, no one's going to take his place for me, you know. Um, and I can't believe I ended up getting to, to play with him and become friends. And um, he, he was my mentor. I became really interested in music of all kinds and eventually came to classical music, which is um, not all banjo players come to classical music.
So, but I ended up really attempting to be a composer. I was writing my first banjo concerto. I think the imposter thing, um, coming from a broken home, you know, where you're trying to achieve and you're trying to prove you're worthwhile because your parents split up and one of them wasn't around. And, uh, and so I think I, I got a lot of spin off of, um, you know, not feeling that worthwhile. So when I did find something I cared about, I put myself into it very, very wholeheartedly. But um, Bluegrass has gradually become the place where I actually am at home. I don't get home that often, but when I get home, it's home, you know? And so that's part of why I made this record over the last couple of years, this uh, Bluegrass Heart record. Everything got recorded kind of just before COVID hit. We had been recording in uh, 2019, and we finished our last overdubs uh, maybe March 12th of 2020, and then everything shut down. Richard was the sound man uh, for Newgrass Revival starting at the end of 1982. That's how long we've been together. And so he has always done whatever it took to keep me going. But with each album, he, uh, he has a different concept. It's, he's not trying to duplicate everything over and over again. And he's very specific and particular. Once Pro Tools came about, I turned into a tech head. And ever since then, I've just been into editing and mixing. And uh, gradually, I started taking over the mixing from the engineers. You know, I started just doing more and more of it. We would tweak the mixes till they were just like really sounding good. Um, and so that became kind of a trademark thing about the Flectones. And what I would say is when all you've got is instruments, that's all you got is how it sounds. When I put on the, the headphones and started listening to the Bartok, um, all of a sudden I heard all kinds of things in the mix that I didn't know were problems. I could hear clicks, I could hear panning details. Uh, there, was, there was so much going on. I have to say it was the best headphone preamp I had ever heard. Um, and so I started using that to refine things because there's a lot of things that happen unconsciously when you're listening to something. You're assessing as a listener, you're hearing the notes, but you're also unconsciously hearing how good it sounds. And if something sounds really good, it makes everything better. Just like sometimes people say, how can I become a better banjo player? I say, in, you know, really fast. I say, get a better banjo. Yeah.